Yeah, so there is the classical question, do you think that uh, an emulation of uh, yeah, um, a mind will one day be conscious? So I will ask a slightly different question, do you think that there will be one day one artificial intelligence having a free will? Yes or no, when and so on. Uh, I have an easy answer, yes, because uh, I, I'm a compatibilist. I believe that uh, the universe might very well be deterministic, but we have free will in any case, because free will is about how you act on the kind of human scale. Can you be held responsible for what you're doing, uh, etc. What happens on the neural scale doesn't really matter for free will. So anybody bringing up quantum mechanics as an argument for or against free will, in my opinion, is kind of talking about the wrong thing. I can't say, oh, sorry, no, no, I did that, but actually it wasn't me, it was my neurons. No, it's an emergent property. And I think the same thing would go for artificial intelligence. It wouldn't be too hard to have free will in artificial intelligence. Whether we want that or not might depend on which artificial intelligence it is. It's, it's interesting reflecting on Randall's work because I personally have been more enthusiastic about the idea of brain-computer interfaces leading to digital twinning. And we're starting a project on that right now at University of Massachusetts Boston where I work. Um, and the idea of digital twinning would mean the kind of dynamic recording of your consciousness, your memories, your experiences, your reactions to things. Um, in ways that addresses Randall's issue about the car being still, you know, just having a model of the car versus knowing what it means to drive. And the architecture of a digital twin could be very, very different from, you know, very distal from the connectomics, right? I have a sure. So, uh, digital twinning or something like it is something you can do at many different levels or scales, of course. So, for example, the people who are working on the hippocampus prosthesis, it's a kind of digital twinning in the sense that they're doing input-output um, recordings and they're trying to build a model uh, based on that of the hippocampus. Mm -hmm. What you very quickly get with any system with any meaningful level of complexity is that the number of potential latent functions in that system that are there is so huge that even if you recorded everything you could about the organism from the beginning of its life to the end of its life, you couldn't possibly capture all the latent functions that are in there. Mm -hmm. This is also a point that Conrad Recording was making about various ways of doing neuroscience, that that also kind of falls into that trap, that your digital twinning is only going to capture the observed twin. So only that part. And anything you didn't observe, who knows if it's similar or not. It's just, you can't know, really. Take it. I take your question, and I, but I think you know what point that you've often made is um, if we could figure out how to do something like fly, uh, you know, we we study the birds, but then we come up with a plane, and the plane flies. So it may be that we'll figure out sufficient amount of complexity of the human mind to do sufficient amount of modeling. But in terms of the question of free will, just from my Buddhist perspective, the idea is not whether it's going to achieve free will or not, it's whether it will achieve the illusion of self, right? That at some point, yeah, at some point it would, the, the model would sit, wake up and say, I exist and I want to perpetuate my own existence. That's the kind of threshold for AGI that you know, I'm looking for. And I think that we will see that soon in artificial intelligence. And then the question is, what would happen if we were trying to digitally twin ourselves? What would happen if our digital twin had that, right? We wouldn't want our digital twin to feel schizophrenic like it was, it was me, but not me at the same time. So those are the kinds of questions I'm concerned about. <laughs> Um, yeah, maybe maybe on that topic, uh, an important distinction to make is the one between a simulation and an emulation. Um, a simulation could just be a purely phenomenological reproduction of the observable behavior of a system. So let's say that you're trying to predict the weather, then you may have a very simple statistical model that could be reasonably accurate in, in predicting the weather over the in upcoming days, but the model would know nothing about currents of air in the atmosphere or any of the mechanics of how that system actually works. It's just a very superficial analogy of that. Um, emulation, on the other hand, what sets it apart from a simulation is that it tries to reproduce the, the underlying mechanisms of the original system that it tries to emulate. So it wouldn't just be a simple statistical model if we're talking about the brain but it will be a model that would involve neurons that are connected in a network that are interacting 
in a way that's very analogous to the way that we know the brain works. Um, so, it, I mean, we, we don't completely know the consequences of any of this because we haven't, we haven't quite achieved whole brain emulation, even for a C. elegans, you know, it's kind of questionable if we're there yet. Um, but it, it feels like this is an important distinction to make, you know, do we have this illusion of free will, like to the outside observer, does it look like, okay, that system can have free will? Or we have the luxury when we make a simulation that we can open the hood and take a look at the actual mechanisms, the algorithms, the functions that are inside. And if these are replicating very precisely what's happening in the real brain, perhaps to you, and maybe this is a bit of a subjective thing, but maybe to you that would already get closer to what you would define as real consciousness or real free will. At the risk of taking this in a weird direction, are you talking about philosophical zombies? <laughs> I mean, it sounded to me like your simulation of the weather was almost a philosophical zombie of a weather predicting program or something like that. Yeah, right? yeah, sure. Uh, so, so the philosophical zombie is an interesting cause. I think it doesn't exist, cannot exist in real life, because on zombie earth, the zombie philosophers go to the... Just explain the philosophy. Yeah, so this is a typical philosophical thought experiment that there could be beings that are just like us, behave just like us, but we don't have any internal consciousness. And the question is, can you tell me apart from a zombie Anders? And by the thought experiment, you cannot. But I actually think the concept is incoherent. If you have zombie Earth somewhere out in the universe, there should be zombie philosophers going to conferences about consciousness. Why are we going to conferences about consciousness? One of the infinitely many properties they don't have. Why aren't we going to conference about other stuff? It's kind of contrived. But when you make a simulation or emulation, it's always a matter of what do you want to use it for? What properties matter? The weather simulation we do because we want to know whether it's going to rain on a picnic. That is the important part. We, most of us don't care too much about the airflow. Some of us are a bit nerdy and actually would like to know that, and it's interesting physics. It also becomes more robust if you make it more accurate. Beyond a certain point, it's not worth it anymore. We're just wasting computing power on the fine details that don't matter. If we run this on a neural network, one aspect we might want is it's close enough that it actually can do the same thing as the original brain. Another thing might be it's actually conscious or it has uh, a sense of self, even though it might not be the same self as the original brain. And various levels in between might have various combinations. What worries me ethically about this whole endeavor is that eventually we are going to have virtual lab animals normal lab animals, we should not be cruel against them, at what point do we have to care for the virtual mice? And what about the virtual mouse that is not working? You're just getting that upside down sad mouse icon. Uh, do I still need to run it? Or maybe I should absolutely not run it because it's in a bad state? How do I tell? That is going to be a headache, uh, which is going to keep us ethicists rather busy. Can I just ask? There is a question. Oh, I just wanted to say, I think you can make a philosophical zombie philosopher for a limited amount of time. Not for a very long amount of time, but for some period of time that you're observing the philosopher, a lookup table could probably do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We're going to take a question now. Uh, I have a question about the human and transhumanism. So I wonder, um, what, do we, yeah, what do we define as humans? What do we want to preserve um, as human? So, for example, there's this novel by Greg Egan, I think it's called Diaspora, and there's like three different kinds of people. One's just uh, robots, artificial intelligences that just look like humans. Then there's people who are kind of in the matrix, and they're very, very abstract subjects. They just build their abstract spaces and do math in them. And then there's some people, and they are... Uh, all kinds of different people, some were very intelligent, some wanted to devolve back before language, like, uh, like uh, apes. And um, I wonder, um, is this all human? Do we, at what, at what, as what do we identify? Do we identify as kind of cells? Do we identify as kind of humans, as in, you know, we have sex and we eat and all this? Or is it just a, a subject that can do only, I don't know, abstract algebra? Um, what do we want to preserve? Uh, is this up to ourselves or is this up to our society to decide that? 
I'll, t I'll take a quick uh, cut of that. Um, I think it's important for us all to interrogate the intuition that um, some of these technologies may threaten the, hu the things about being human that we value, and then say, well, what are those things? And could technology enhance those things? So for instance, this is part of the moral enhancement debate, that if our capacity for empathy, our capacities for self-control or whatever are part of the what we value about being human, then we should try to enhance those and not just uh, see them be threatened. So yeah, it's an incredibly important question. I, I think also, we use the word human in different senses, in different uh, contexts. And again, it's kind of useful to think about what do I want human to mean in this particular conversation? For example, we talk about human rights. That is rights that we both in society and globally want to uh, preserve because there is a certain kind of entity, humans, that are worth moral considerations and they have properties that make it very important, for example, to respect the bodily integrity. Robots might actually not need uh, bodily integrity in the same way because they can always buy a new body if the old one is broken. They would need, have a different style of rights and maybe transhumans that could easily, equally easily modularize the body might actually have a difference there. The important part seems to be to understand is there some particular political flashpoint? Like in the earlier talk here about our cognitive rights, I think a lot of the things going on in our brains are very important to keep secure, private, and respected. And that is probably where we might say here is some core issues we need to resolve before we can mess with brains too much. There are some others that are more debatable. It's kind of like the family resemblance between humans. Well, if some people turn into lizard men, that might still not matter very much because it's their minds that are still enough human. That definition, however, as Greg Giga notes in another novel, human and health are the two most powerful and dangerous worlds in this debate because if you define away something from being healthy or human, then there is no support in society. So this is where our transhumanist debate in society must take place. Yeah, I'll just say one of the things I really love about Diaspora as a novel is in, within the first 20 pages, he says, look, a, machine, uh, a society of machine minds, everything would be modulable. You'd be able to change anything that you want about your brain. And so the protagonist has to define, these are the things that I'm going to protect and make sure that they're not changed. It's like you know, locking down your settings in your computer or something. And I think that's an incredibly insightful um, thing that he does in the novel because we will increasingly have uh, control over the most fundamental aspects of the things that we consider to be central to our selfhood. And the existential crisis that we, will, that we experience when we're able to change those things is going to be profound. Um, I think it's very hard to define human and what constitutes a human because there's such a, an enormous diversity and variety um, and I think this actually works in our favor because as we begin to integrate with AI we don't immediately have to let go of our concept of being human. We can be human integrated with AI but still be human. Uh, and I think this, so this is something that is not going to radically change from one day to the next, but it's something that will, will gradually transition. I know I'd, I'm, I probably shouldn't read the whole quote, but just to, uh, something that I, I had to think of is a quote from uh, Robert Heinlein. A human being should be able to change a diaper, plan an invasion, butcher a hog, come a ship, design a building, write a sonnet, etc., etc. So this is kind of open-endedness to human experience and, and what it constitutes to be a human. Um, you guys give so much to think about and, and questions after questions. I will just constrain myself, limit myself to a couple of questions. Um, firstly, are you familiar with the work of Robert Sampolsky? And that is about free will. And he uh, comes to the conclusion that there is no free will, which is very nice for us because it makes emulation and those kind of things easier. Um, so that, that is connected to the second question and that is the digital twin. A couple of months ago in Dubai I had a deep conversation with people who are really building digital twins. And here is the rub. 
Who is in control of a digital twin? Is it me for the digital twin or the digital twin to me? Or can we build a digital twin that synchronizes with me? So if I'm stepping here, I'm different. But is that digital twin different as well? Does that digital twin need so much computational power to synchronize with me? And that is the third question that I have, haven't heard here today about. Everything that we are doing is completely depending on electricity. And we are running out of power. What are we doing in transhumanism? related to electricity, to power. Well, maybe if I could, if I could briefly comment on that last point. Um, in my research, I'm a computational neuroscientist, so I build large-scale models of the human brain. And um, in my research institute, where I work in Germany, we're actually just building what will be the biggest supercomputer of Europe. And this bad boy is going to consume 22 megawatts of power at its peak operating capacity. Um, I don't have a, a precise prediction of the sizes of the neural networks that computer will be able to simulate. It's more than ever before, but it's not going to be at the scale of the human brain. So clearly this is untenable if you extrapolate the scaling laws. But exactly because we, we realize that this is untenable, there is now a vast momentum towards uh, developing neuromorphic hardware. So this is, uh, these are microchips, just like the microchip that we saw in, in Rendell's presentation. But it's not built like the regular processor in our, in our laptops or in our computers, but it's structurally modeled to, uh, to mirror the structure of the brain. And this will take orders of magnitude off of the power consumption. But are those, they have a life cycle. And are they not getting obsolete, let's say, in five years from now? Definitely. Yes. Inevitably, it's technology. <laughs> but we will come up with, a, with another version that is ten times more efficient and ten times more powerful. Except when I have it in my brain, because then it has to be taken out in a new one. Uh, we can do over-the-air upgrades. <laughs> <laughs> over-the-air upgrades on my brain sounds very scary. Uh, by the way, 22 megawatts, I think that is a big-ish wind power plant, a single one. So you could imagine putting that on top of a data center to make a kind of an ultimate green one. Uh, but I, I do think there is something important here. Well, how much computational power do you want to have your digital twin to have? At one level, you have an emulation that has to run everything you're doing. But for most work on digital twins, you don't want a perfect emulation. You want an answer to a useful question. It's a little bit like when I was working on the ethics of autonomous cars. We want moral proxies. My car should be doing what I would want morally to do if I were the car and could react as fast. It doesn't need to simulate my entire moral outlook. It needs to kind of understand the right kind of reactions. And that's much smaller and probably a tiny neural network it's a much harder question, how do I get it out of my brain into the car? And of course, we might still have a discussion about the rules for the road. Do we want to have sociopathic cars on the road? What about all those utilitarian Swedish cars kind of you know, coordinating for the common good against the German, the ontological cars that think that the rules are very important to follow? Uh, so you have other problems, but I do think that we have an option for quite a lot of replica simulations and digital twins. My worry about this, we're already seeing that people are confused about language models being conscious, because of course they say they're conscious, they're trained on human data, we humans say we're conscious all the time. So the end result is, even Google engineers can get confused by that. More and more normal people are going to get confused by that. And we're going to end up in a world where we're going to be very uncertain about what is thinking and conscious and what is not. And that might be morally problematic. Just to come back to your question about free will, I think the position that you articulated and that I would also agree with is com compatibilism. The, the notion that 
it, at the fundamental level of reality, um, the universe is somehow deterministic, but at the level of human experience, it's, it's not, that we experience it not being. And when you think about digital twins, I think one of the interesting questions we'll have is how does the architecture, the software, and the hardware of the di twinning process constrain the behavior of that twin, right? It would an Apple digital twin act differently than a Microsoft digital twin, right? And we, these are the kinds of constraints on free will that we may be very concerned about in the future. If I, quick uh, question, just to finish off perhaps. Uh, my question is about where do you go for answers to all these big questions? Because we've had some very hard questions we're talking about, which might influence how we design AIs in the future. Now, some people have said, well, we're going to get the answers by studying science. We're going to look at the brain carefully, and we're going to work it out scientifically. Other people have said, well, you should be looking at Greg Egan or Robert Heinlein, because they've thought about it, and you'll get inspiration there. Or maybe we should look at Aristotle and the philosophers. But what I want to ask you about is two other sources, potentially, of answers. One of them is the psychonauts, who said, you know, there are alternative dimensions to conscious experience, which uh, most of us can't get. But if you take various uh, psychotropic drugs or whatever, you gl glimpse parts of reality which scientists currently don't understand. And secondly, there's the vast Buddhist literature and other uh, sacred uh, traditions, which also claim to have an insight which uh, modern science doesn't get to. So are you at all sympathetic, any of you, to saying that we should be studying these two other avenues and that will help us to understand how we can deal with human m mind issues and how we can understand uh, AI mind issues in the near future? Well, of course, I'm very enthusiastic about both of those avenues. My experience as a psychonaut never really um, validated it as a scientific methodology. Um, I think Buddhism has a longer tradition of trying to use introspection as a scientific methodology. And so I do think you, we have a lot to learn there. And I'm, I'm actually, if anyone's interested, we're working on a project on applying Buddhist ideas to human enhancement with the Italian Buddhist Association. Uh, generally, I think one should probably try to use as many approaches as possible when you're highly uncertain about what's going on. Eric Parents, an eminent bioethicist, said that you want to use double vision. You want to look at the problem both rationally and maybe emotionally. But of course we want to actually have more eyes. We're transhumans. We can have as many eyes as we want. In the end, though, we end up a bit like those autonomous cars and the traffic rules. We want to get out of all this directions for what we're going to do in the lab, both in terms of overall strategy that looks promising, but also how to avoid being moral monsters against the lab animals. We might want to come up with important caveats about suffering and phenomenology in artificial intelligence and other systems. And for that, there might be that we never get consensus, but we might still get enough consensus about what to do to limit risks. So I think that at this stage, we should actually be using quite a lot of approach and be open for that. It's just that we shouldn't expect all of them to line up nicely, or one of them to suddenly give a blazing revelation that explains it all. Um, I think your question ties in very nicely to the subject of Randall's presentation, because he spoke specifically about success criteria for whole brain emulation. How do you validate that the whole brain emulation is capturing the real thing, is, is doing what you want it to do, and not just for um, a certain small subset of scenarios that you've devised as a scientist, but that it generalizes and that it'll behave the same as the, as the, the original um, in, in the general case. And maybe um, studying, let's say, alternative brain dynamics, alternative subjective experience like this, um, could help to resolve what kind of tests we want to define for that. Um, I think the tests will need to be taken place at two different levels of study. Um, we can look at the network dynamics, so we can, we can measure the activity of brain cells in, in, in real biological brains, and we can measure the activity of cells in our computer simulation, and we expect them to show more or less the same behavior, to show delta rhythms and, and gamma rhythms and so on. Um, that's, that's one side, and then the other side would be to basically just ask the person, to ask the simulation, how do you feel? 
And um, perhaps if we then link that with how that individual self reported their subjective experience to be before the upload, then that could be another way of validating that the upload was a success. Maybe a final closing comment. There's just, there's, there happens to be a nice tie-in for what you're talking about from the work that um, the Berger and Dong Song labs have done on the hippocampal prosthesis, which is that uh, when they had patients that they connected their model to, uh, you know, they would they would have a, a surgery for epilepsy, and in the process, they were allowed to do these experiments, and they had 72 hours to build the model and then do the tests. And during that time, not only did they have them do tests where they could test the performance of the system, but they also asked the patients how they felt when the model was on and performing, when the model was off, and when the model was on, but the output was randomized so that it was just producing random activity. Uh, the performance results for that, very interesting. What the patients reported was they had absolutely no clue when the thing was on or not. <laughs> like, they couldn't tell the difference at all. This isn't, of course, you know, for, for every experience, it, it will be different, but that was an interesting, like, first little test like that and asking a patient, what is this like, I thought. Okay, well, we're going to end the session. I would like to thank... Um, our two presenters for the very nice talks and also the panelists for leading this discussion and I will invite all of you to take the discussion to the coffee bar for our 30 minute break.